Thank you, David. Um, we'll call the meeting to order. May I have a motion to call the meeting to order? Commissioner Alwell, seconded by Commissioner Ivanchik. All those in favor of uh, calling the meeting to order, say aye. 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 All right, any opposed, any extensions? All right, next is we have a agenda that we had posted. Um, any changes, amendments to the agenda? The agenda that was posted on uh, board docs, we're gonna make a couple modifications. Um, item number two will be public forum, public comment. Item number three will be uh, Superintendent Flanagan's uh, presentation of the Burlington School District. So school district presentation will be item number three. Um, item number four will be the city of Burlington's presentation with uh, Moreau, uh, Mayor Moreau Weinberger presenting as well as um, there'll be a couple items under that, but we'll just keep it as item number, what did I just say? I said four. Four, thank you. And then item five will be um, <coughs> school board so. member city council, uh, Claire will I'll be asking uh, an agenda item just to talk about a collaborative um, role for both a school board member and a city councilor. So, in the original agenda, just so everyone's clear, the COVID response, we folded in these items into each of the presentations, one by the school board and one by the city. So all of the items are covered, nothing is, uh, nothing is not covered. And then the added item would be um, an item that I brought up with the school board to look for a partnership with the city council and then adjournment. And we hope to have the meeting for no more greater than 90 minutes. Um, with each of the entities, the school district and the, the city speaking for uh, roughly 10 minutes, uh, the superintendent, and the mayor, and followed by Q&A with the city council and the school board members up to around 25 minutes. So the, may I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Commissioner Waltz, seconded by? Commissioner Carey, all those in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Oh. The agenda has been passed. Next is public comment. Is there any member of the public um, who would like to speak um, at public comment tonight? Please raise your hand on the icon. All right, seeing none, we'll move from public comment to uh, Superintendent Flanagan, welcome. Great, thank you, Chair Will. It's great to, great to see you all. Um, I hear that these events used to have food. This is my first, first one of these convenings. I, I hope to someday soon have one of these with food and with us all together in person. Um, hopefully we're, we'll get back to that at some point in the not too distant future. And um, really looking forward to the opportunity uh, tonight to, to talk to you a bit. I have a presentation, so I'll share my screen um, and walk through the presentation. It should take me about 10 minutes. Um, and then um, I'll, we'll just open it up for discussion. So I, I'd have asked uh, Victor Prusak, he is our um, uh, engagement uh, specialist, and so he is our coordinator, I, I should say, um, and has has been kind of leading the 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 lead sort of connector from from um, my office to uh, the mayor's office, and has worked with a number a number of you all as well. Um, so I wanted him to be here. Um, we will talk a little bit about the budget tonight, but there I I am going to be coming to you um, with with Claire uh, and with Nathan. Uh, Lavery um, to do a budget presentation next Monday night. So I'll keep that part of it relatively, relatively brief. Um, and so with that, I will share my screen. Okay. Is everyone seeing this okay? Great. Mm -hmm. Um, so the purpose uh, tonight is really to 
provide um, an, an uh, update on where we are with COVID-19. There's a whole lot moving there for us in, in the district. So I wanna let you know where we are there. I wanted to share the BHS BTC project updates and discuss the bond impl implications related to that project and to review our district strategic plan, which we're near in the, in the um, close to finishing up that uh, and getting ready to begin implementation on the, our strategic plan. And then again, that kind of quick conversation about, about the budget leading us into our Monday uh, evening meeting to present the full budget to you. So the first first thing is is COVID. Um, you know, I I started um, about a week after I was offered the position. Thank you, thank you all for trusting in me and offering me the position. Um, I was down in Providence, and we had to close Providence. And and so when I came up here, um, I've I've really only experienced Burlington in a in a pandemic, which is. I, I feel like I've I, I love it here, and I've also missed a lot. Um, and in some ways, I forget what it's like to to be in a school district where we are not managing a really major um, crisis. Uh, and I know you all are feeling the same thing. So um, one of the things that that we are really working to do, and have been working to do throughout our time um, managing through this pandemic, is to keep students and staff safe number one, and number two, to keep students in school in person as much as possible. There's tons of evidence that being in school is much better for, for students, for their, there's been a lot of talk about, about learning and sort of the loss of learning when students are out of school. And interestingly, we didn't see a huge amount. We did see some kind of dip in our ELA and math scores on the state assessment this last year, but not as much as I would have predicted but we have seen a lot of challenges uh, among students, just kind of social emotional wellness. Um, and so I think just the impacts of being out of school just have such a, an enormous impact on our kids. And, and you could, you know, you can hear it in when you talk to pretty much any student, um, they, they really wanna be in, in school. And so that's, that's been a real priority of ours is to, is to make sure that we're keeping schools open and there's been a lot of back end work to make sure that that, that has happened. Um, there, there, uh, we we have been doing kind of a couple of major strategies that have been, uh, I think, working pretty well. The test to stay um, program, which is where if you are um, an unvaccinated student who is um, a close contact, you can come in and receive a, a, a test, um, and you can stay if it is negative. Um, and then um, our contact tracing. So we've been doing lots and lots and lots of contact tracing. Anytime there, there is a, a positive case, we do a line list and we, we, we contact trace. We're spending, our school nurses are spending hours and hours and hours every day starting at 6 a.m. and ending at 9.30 and 10 o'clock at night um, doing this contact tracing. And it, it, is, it is actually becoming unmanageable. Um, so it, we are... It, it, one of the things that that um, I, I want you to kind of know and and understand um, before it comes out is that on Tuesday we've learned I learned just today from Secretary French that on Tuesday the state is planning to come out with significant major updates to their policy um, around contact tracing and testing and so we don't know what that is yet um, but but uh, I keep an eye out for that and I'll be messaging out any updates. Um, in addition to that, we had some more recent updates uh, that just came out on Sunday evening around quarantining and isolation that moved that period from of quarantine isolation from 10 to five days. Um, and, and so that was a, a big shift that we made this, this year, uh, or this since, since break, since Monday. Um, continuing to really focus on masking uh, indoors, making sure people are staying home when they're sick, um, sort of monitoring visitors um, and, and just doing this overall work of keeping, keeping, the, community, keeping the community safe. Um, 
sorry that this this may feel a little disjointed. I'm in some ways just trying to capture the big ideas and put them all together in as condensed a format as possible. So we'll have time for plenty of open discussion um, when I'm when I'm through here. But we're really excited to have um, to be close to presenting a strategic plan uh, to the board. And Victor Prusak has been leading on that. Uh, so he can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and we've been working closely with, with um, our school board, obviously, around the strategic plan leading up to this point. And so we're looking forward to January 18th to um, presenting the final strategic plan. It's been a really awesome process in many ways. We, we prioritized radical inclusion uh, and co-creation. So a lot of times what happens is districts um, or school boards and districts will kind of create priorities and, and give them to people and ask for feedback, right, from the community. Um, and this is a kind of a reverse model of that where we, we trained a bunch of people, a bunch of community members, uh, including students and families, um, in doing empathy interviews. And they went around and did over 100 empathy interviews around town and asked people their experiences in our district. They brought those back, this group of about 50 uh, uh, community members, um, and created a set of priorities. So we have a, we have five priorities that we'll be presenting, and, and you'll uh, hopefully we'll we'll pass this on January 18th, and you'll see these new priorities. Um, and it's a five-year plan. We we're just finishing a five-year plan, and so we're we're starting a new five-year plan. Um, and so uh, we one of the things that we're really focusing on doing is uh, making sure that we continue to engage this coalition and a sort of a new phase of the coalition that worked with us to develop the strategic plan to keep the community engaged and involved in the develop in the implementation process um, in sort of this next phase of the work and also developing our internal systems for for keeping pro keeping track of of our, our goals and, and continuing to come back to those and continuing to hold ourselves accountable uh, for, for those goals. So that you should see that coming out soon and that'll, that'll help drive the next five years of our work. Um, as we move on, BHS, BTC, uh, this, there's, I'm sure you've, you've been seeing a lot about this. I know we've communicated some, I've been trying to forward key messages along to, to you all as, as they come through. Um, but as you as you well know, we we investigated over 20 sites um, and and looked really carefully across town to see what was available uh, for a new high school. We landed on Institute Road mostly because it, it we own the land outright now, and um, it allows us to have both our technical center and our high school in the same place. And our technical center has uh, 200 about 300 students, some shared with our school and some and the other and and many coming from across the region um, and that's actually a great program that I'd like to celebrate at some point uh, more publicly and um, we have so we've, we've identified the site we've awarded um, a design contract to Freeman French Freeman uh, Colin Lindbergh and Drummy Roseanne Anderson which is a pretty exciting team of three different uh, three different organizations that have come together. They bring great expertise in CTE development and in design and, and in sort of project management. And, and, um, and so we're really excited about, about the opportunities here. And we've just started the preliminary site assessment and engine, we've completed the preliminary site assessment and engineering. Um, one thing to note is, is um, we did receive new action levels um, that determine the amount of PCBs that can that um, uh, that if they if you if a certain number which is 100 nanograms per cubic meter of PCBs are in the air that um, creates an action at a school to do further investigation. That those new state action levels came out right at the time that we were about to announce um, the the design contract and created a lot of confusion uh, and concern. And so we've been working through that. But the real key thing to, to know there is that the action levels um, are, are related to air. And we have a problem not just in the air, we have a problem in our building materials as well. And those building materials, um, because there are PCBs, these 
chemicals used in building materials in the floor, in the, in the kind of foundation of the floor, the walls, the ceiling, the soil outside, the air. So they're really everywhere throughout the building. Um, and it has become clear to us that it's, it's not um, a viable project to, to renovate this building. Um, so we can talk more about that if you have, if you have more questions later. Uh, but in, we are sort of in the initial um, planning process now. And one, what, what I'd like you to know mostly about the, the planning process is that we're really balancing engagement in, with this steering uh, committee and, and bringing people in and, and workshopping with the community um, to get input. And what, while also using input that we have from pre prior um, engagement we've done with the community around the building, we do have information from prior engagements and what, uh, balancing those two things with a timeline. Um, we, have a, we have an aggressive timeline of opening a building in August of 2025, a new building. And in order to meet that timeline, we need to really, um, we, need, we just need to meet our, our, our project timeline goals. Uh, so that's gonna be really important that we, that we kind of continue, make sure people have the right information that they're engaged in, that we're able to keep the project moving um, and balance that with, with kind of some deep engagement. Um, so what, where we are now is, is really thinking about all the, all the work that we need to do pre-bond. Um, and that is in the winter and the spring, continuing site assessment. Uh, we did sort of initial site assessment. Now we're doing a deeper site assessment, doing concept design and fundraising. And one of the important things to know about fundraising, we're gonna sort of build out our fundraising muscles here in the next couple of, couple of weeks and, and months. But we also have set aside funding from the American Recovery Plan. Uh, we've set aside $10 million of that funding uh, for this project. We've also set aside 1.6 million already of our local budget uh, for this work. So we are, we are gonna be you know, looking at ways to, to, to set aside funding for this project internally, but also reaching out externally um, and, and looking for funding in, in many different ways. And, and there, are a couple, there are a number of different ways that we'll end up uh, looking for funding for this, for this project to really, to really kind of um, help the, the, our taxpayers and our community um, through, this, through this process and help us all feel as a community that we, we've done everything we can uh, to, to bring money to bear to support the, the project. Um, in the summer, we're gonna get to some more specific cost estimates. Uh, and we're aiming for a November 2022 uh, bond. And then the last last slide uh, or second to last slide is around the budget. Um, and so the big the big takeaway here, this shows you the, the homestead tax rate increase over the past three years. The big takeaway is that um, we minimized impact on taxpayers last year by not making significant investments or additions to our local budget, um, or really any at all. Um, and we were able to do that by being disciplined, but also by receiving the funding from the American Recovery Plan. Uh, and so we had funding that we were able to use to support new initiatives, and, and we didn't need to use uh, local funding to do things like bringing restorative practices specialists into all of our schools, providing professional learning opportunities for, for teachers, um, uh, purchasing supplies for um, COVID and, and, and safety uh, PPE and everything. Um, and so we are thankfully also looking forward to um, a modest um, uh, increase next year. So our, our sort of our, our process for budgeting for next year, the, the budget that we will be proposing um, shortly is that we're not making ads uh, or any proposed additions to our local budget. Um, and, um, and, and in addition to that, there, the ed fund has a surplus. So we are potentially looking at lower taxes uh, or a lower uh, homestead tax rate. Um, so you would see a negative number here for FY23, potentially uh, in, our, in our proposed budget. Um, so that's the, the big picture of where we are. Here's the timeline. 
of our next steps uh, around the budget, just so you can see that. But again, you'll see the same slide and the one before on Monday night. And with that, I think I did, I took 15 minutes instead of 10, sorry. Yes, yeah, I just said, uh, I was counting I was 16 minutes. So we're sorry, I was, uh, I, I'm appreciative that um, we were able to get through that and we'll recognize that we went over. So thank you, Superintendent Flanagan. Um, there was a lot to cover there. And so I appreciate um, everyone uh, affording us the time to cover all those topics. At this time for Q&A, uh, because the school board members have had numerous opportunities and meetings to ask questions, we wanna really hear from you, uh, the city council or the mayor or city leadership, um, any questions that you might have. So this opportunity for Q&A is really um, an opportunity for you to speak uh, so that we can listen. So at this time, are there any counselors uh, or district leaders that have any follow-up questions? All right. The biggest takeaway is um, that, go ahead, Councilor Carpenter. Thank you. All right, I didn't know, I, I, I saw my hand in Councilor Barlow as well. Um, a question and actually a couple comments. Um, can you explain the funding relationship of the tech center to the high school? Um, how does that big picture work? Yeah, we get separate, we do get separate funding for our tech tech center. And we also um, have the tech center within our budget. So we do get Perkins funding. Um, and we and we also um, have have districts pay tuition for students that are coming into the tech tech center. So, Is that a, um, I don't know how to ask this. Uh, parochially from the city of Burlington, does it help the city of Burlington being the tech center host? I mean, it's not going away. I don't understand that, but I'm just sort of in the give and take of being the sponsor for that. Is is that a net plus to us or is it does it make a drag on our end of the finances? Um, so I would say BT Burlington Technical Center has some really amazing programming for yeah. students that is getting them licenses and yeah. really preparing them, not just for careers, but for college yeah. uh, and career. And so there's there's a lot of really strong programming at BTC. I've been very impressed by the programming there. It's often thought of as, you know, the old school CTE, which yeah. is sort of preparing for career. And I, I know you know this, but I just figured it was worth saying that um, how, how, how strong the programming is. And half of the students who attend BTC are our students. So of the 300, about, it's not, it's 288, it's about 140, um, uh, give or take that are at uh, BTC and the rest come from our neighboring districts. Um, so we are, we are putting forth some taxpayer dollars to support BTC. Uh, and um, we are also bringing funding in to, from other districts to support that. We do have a great director, uh, Jason Gingold over there who uh, at the Technical Center, who's been really working with the uh, Regional Advisory Board. Um, and there's a lot of interest on that Regional Advisory Board to think about ways that we can better support uh, and, and bring resources into Burlington Technical Center. So I think there's, there's something there. I think absolutely it's worth us having and, and, and but I also, but, um, and it's a great program, but that uh, we, there are some opportunities for us to think about how to, how to better um, support it. Um, just two other quick comments. Um, you mentioned about the PCBs and the decision that we really do need to go forward. And I guess I would ask in about two paragraphs, if you might send us something, because we get that question all the time. Why, you know, why, now the state's a new, level and I would love to have a couple quick talking points that I could tell constituents about your decision, which I believe I would certainly support, but if you could send us that, that would be great. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I also wonder if it's worth, you know, hearing from a couple of board members about that decision to now, you know, I think yeah. that, you know, some of us, myself included, thought, like this might be an opportunity to, to rethink, um, but it became more and more clear 
that it was really wasn't that opportunity because of the the depth of uh, problem with the PCBs. So I don't know if a board member wants to weigh in or not. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Fisher. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, thanks, everybody, and thanks for that question, Sarah um, or Commissioner Carpenter. Uh, I think this is really going to be crucial when we go to bond uh, and through next year to make sure that the public understands this. That the once we started to do the investigation of where the PCBs were coming from and started to look at the building materials, that put us into a different category, and that put us under the auspices of an oversight of the EPA and the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. And so no longer were we just looking at the airborne levels. Um, we've had uh, public speakers at our meetings reiterating, hey, now that the levels are lower, why can't we just put in more you know, air handling? And it's all about the air. And so it's super important that, that, we, under, that we get the public to understand that we're, we're, it's, not, it's not just about the air anymore. The other aspect I think is the potential cost to remediate, right? So we're gonna put something that's a high price tag. And so the question, very good question is, is it, isn't it cheaper to go back to the old high school and remediate the PCBs and maybe even do the old plan for renovation? And we got uh, some opinions from three professional sources on the, on the cost of that, of what that would be. We got some numbers, but what we also found out is there's a lot that we don't know. And so I was talking this through with a constituent and going through the materials. And I think we can actually come up with some even better materials with some other numbers because what we don't know, we should be able to put some kind of estimate and some kind of number so that taxpayers can see, hey, here's the range that we're talking about. If we go back to the old school, Here's the range that it could be, and it could go up to this, and it could take this amount of time. We're talking about years to get back into that building and a lot of unknowns and a lot of risks. So I think when we go public, you know, when we talk to the taxpayers, both the city council and the board, we should be able to put everything up on a side by side and say, here's what it would take to go back to the old school. And here's what a new campus would look like. So it's clear that this is the right choice in terms of cost, risk, and timing. One brief comment, and we could follow up offline. You know, we've been spending a lot of time on after the reappraisal and the tax increase. And one thing that's affected a ton of taxpayers is the lag in the homestead credit. And I just think jointly in, we need to do a really good PR campaign. For a lot of people, they should make it, make it up in, um, FY23, but they don't understand it that way. So there's a whole bunch of community work that needs to be done explaining and proving <laughs> that for a lot of people that this was a one-time problem, so. Got it. And Council Carpenter, I will, we will develop a couple of, you know, paragraphs to send around so you have that for. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Commissioner Barlow, uh, City Councilor Barlow. Um, thank you. Um, Councilor Carpenter actually asked one of my questions, which was that, that I've asked some of the school commissioners, which is around, is there any way to salvage, um, particularly a building, because it is some of the most expensive part of a new high school, the auditorium, food services, I know has been operating out of there. And I thank you for sort of elaborating on why we can't. I think the unknowns definitely are prob problematic and, um, and remediation being unknown, it's probably, it makes sense uh, to, to build new, but um, the context that that question is being asked in is the, is the size of the ask we're gonna make of taxpayers. It's going to be, I mean, a, a brand new school when we were looking at this back in 2014, 15 was, was $120 million. So we can probably safely assume it's gonna be north of that. Um, and it's really, it's, it's, it's probable that we're going to max out the city's debt policy or come pretty, pretty near to it um, if we were to try to bond for all of that. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm thankful to hear that at least looks like almost uh, $12 million has been sort of earmarked already. 
um, but it's certainly going to be a huge ask. Um, and so the more the more of that that we can get from other sources, obviously, um, the better that's going to be for the city, the city's finances as a whole. So um, I can only say that that's that, you know, I'm hoping and I'm encouraged to hear this, but I'm hoping that 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 is definitely um, the, the priority right now is to try to get as much money as we can from other places before we go ask the uh, the city taxpayers for you know 100 plus million dollars yeah so but thank you for that that was that was informative Thanks. any other counselor i see one hand up but i don't know who it's assigned to anybody um counselor Yang, i have a question can i ask yes Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. So thank you, Tom. Thank you all for being here. And I think I have a couple of questions. And one of them is specific, is specific to how much have you received from the American rescue plan? And it seems you're only putting aside 10 million. How much have you received in total? Uh, 26 million is, or around 26 million is the overall. Um, but we are receiving it in installments. And the, the initial installment was um, really around getting, lifting up and getting prepared um, under the original, um, in, the, in the original pandemic, uh, or when, the, sorry, when the pandemic first hit. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we've, we've allocated um, you know, about half uh, for the building, but the other half we are, we are utilizing um, in ways that we really are required to, uh, which is to um, address the impacts of COVID on the learning and social emotional well-being of, of students. So the American Recovery Plan, uh, to, to create the American Recovery Plan, each district, their own, each district has an allotment of, of funds for, uh, um, that the state gave to us. And we have to submit a plan to them. And we did a, um, a process where we received feedback, developed a plan um, and, and submitted a plan to the, Amer to the, um, to the state uh, that was approved. And the plan was in the areas of academics, social and emotional learning um, and, um, and attendance and making sure that students were, were attending. Um, so we've done, some things the, the important thing to note with the American Recovery Plan funding is that it lasts until the year 2024, the 2024 25 school year. And so it is limited, they're limited term funds. So we've been careful not to create uh, many positions, but we have utilized some position. We have developed uh, like the, the initiative to bring restorative practices specialists into each of the schools to continue to build out that priority and to create spaces that are um, restorative in our in our schools and restorative school cultures. Um, so we have to we have to create a balance of how we of how we uh, plan and, and spend those those funds. So we're looking at curricular resources, um, literacy uh, in our in our K5 uh, literacy program bringing in curriculum uh, and training to, to support more consistency and more um, strategic uh, literacy instruction. So lots of, lots of different types of um, initiatives or uh, strategies like that. Thank you, Councilor Deng. Any other follow-up questions? What I can share is that um, we look for the, also as, as a board, uh, when we touched upon fundraising, um, we are looking for a campaign, uh, you know, advisor, supervisor, many board members have talked about um, the, the, the city helping us in this role as well, and counselors, um, that, you know, our goal will be to 
to lessen the burden on taxpayers. Uh, Commissioner Waltz and I are on the regional board for the tech center. People like Kyle Clark, Beta Technology, these people are hungry to help us, along with Chuck Lacey, Mount Mansfield Union, um, whose daughter is an amazing artist. Uh, and so, especially at the state of the state address from Governor Scott, citing specifically career and technology, uh, technical education yesterday. So we are very passionate about the success of fundraising independently from the taxpayers' uh, responsibility for uh, their own high school and, and, and this regional tech center uh, here in Burlington. So that is a big goal of ours that we look forward to pursuing. And I know um, City Councilor Barlow has been always passionate about helping us and, and developing a campaign. And so over the next you know, few weeks, Superintendent Flanagan and myself and our board uh, will be working on what that looks like so that we can also present those opportunities. And we hope in partnership with you as, as city leaders that you, you know, we've seen the opportunity that Let's Grow Kids and funding for UVM's foundation and Champlain College, as well as, um, you know, other institutions of, of higher learning have been successful in campaigns for buildings. And lastly, um, with the awarding of these architects, um, one of the architects comes strongly from Massachusetts. As we know, we are the only state east of Indiana that doesn't have construction aid. Um, and so there are so many examples in Massachusetts of schools that have had PCB problems where the old school sits in the shadows of the new school being built. So fiscally responsible um, you know, school boards in Massachusetts and Connecticut all over New England have had to deal with this problem. We are the first in Burlington that would be undertaking such uh, a, a, a task, but we also drive people to the state of Vermont and being our only high school uh, in the state of, in the city of Burlington uh, and this tech center that has um, received incredible uh, opportunities for students or received accolades and, and is poised for success and support from many uh, business leaders throughout the state. Um, we, we, are, we are hopeful that at this time of need, that it isn't just a Burlington City taxpayer problem to build these two new buildings or one campus, that it's unified throughout the state. Um, and we have reached out to our senators um, and delegation, political uh, delegations. Um, and they, I think they're waiting for our presentation of what it looks like. And we are finally there in this, this time uh, entering 2022 to be able to know where we're going to be building, what it looks like, have the talented people who have done this before and successfully integrating tech centers with a high school. Um, so we feel very hopeful and, and um, excited about this uh, next step. So with that, thank you. I, our time is up for our, our Q&A. Um, and if there's any other follow-up questions, of course, we're available by email. Um, and we welcome that open door uh, policy on email to ask any questions. And we will equip you with what you've asked for, um, not only uh, Councilor Carpenter, but we know it benefits all of us and our mission that if you have you know, information that you need to speak to your constituents, um, now's the time. So thank you for your time. And next, uh, uh, Mayor Moreau Weinberger, welcome. Great. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire. Um, uh, and thank you all for, for being here. I really appreciate this opportunity to meet like this. Um, uh, it's something that I think really uh, helped with the city um, uh, city Council, school board um, relationship for a number of years there, and I think developing the kind of relationship I'm sitting down regularly helped us get through some, some challenges several years ago, culminating, I think, in some ways in that 2018 uh, agreement um, that really tried grappling with a tough issue. How do we, how do we both meet these uh, very substantial infrastructure needs um, with a shared and limited tax base? Um, and uh, I think we've missed uh, having this uh, forum to get together and talk um, through the pandemic. And I uh, really appreciate uh, Claire and Tom um, being committed to, to, to and, and uh, President Tracy um, for being committed to, to make this, this happen again. 
Um, ironically, I think it comes at a time when this district and the city government are in some ways as coordinated, certainly as they've ever been in, in my decade in this role. I am really greatly appreciative of the partnership um, of Superintendent Flanagan, of Tom, uh, in the very tumultuous, incredible, you know, a little more than a year that uh, he's been with us having to face major challenges. Um, we, uh, we are working uh, as closely as I've been able to work with any superintendent and, and, and beyond that, um, the way in which uh, uh, Tom deployed and, and, and Victor um, coordinated with uh, the, the city um, through the uh, toughest months of the pandemic pre-vaccine um, was uh, was um, unlike anything else uh, in terms of school city coordination in the past, and it continues to this day. I know Victor spent a good chunk of his day on the phone with our planning director, Megan Tuttle, um, looking at whether we should be buying uh, masks together or um, masks together and, and teaming up with sort of to get the kind of bulk purchasing power and, and dealing with this very you know, kind of challenging vendor situation right now. So, so that's ongoing. Um, I, I'm trying to, it, it, the timing of this meeting is really important because town meeting day is coming soon. Um, there are three major issues that I, I want to talk to you about. So I'm going to keep my COVID remarks pretty short and, and I'm happy to answer questions if people do have questions for me about COVID um, uh, and really focus on the three items that we are considering bringing forward um, on town meeting day. Um, and uh, um, each of these, uh, so we're going to dive into it. I am going to ask for some help from uh, members of the city team. Uh, Chapin Spencer, our director of public works, is here, who will help talk about the capital bond. Um, Catherine Shad, uh, uh, our CAO, um, is going to help me. I, I'm going to kick off some discussion about the FY23 budget. Um, and then uh, uh, we also are going to talk about a tax increment financing project that we have been in some ways working on for, for a decade, for many years, um, and which we have some key decisions coming up on soon. It's a, it's a Main Street project. So um, with that, I think we have a PowerPoint that Jordan will get up. We had hoped to get this PowerPoint out to you earlier. I, um, I'm sorry we were able, weren't able to do that. We will send around an email afterwards and, and perhaps a, a supplemental memo as well. So you'll have written documentation um, coming out of this. Uh, just. Uh, with the holiday, uh, it was it was a little bit challenging, and I know because of the holiday too. Some of this information is going to be not just news to this school district, but um, I think some city councilors are. Uh, this is an important early discussion um, uh, on these town meeting day items. The board of finance has heard much of this, but some of this may be new to councilors as well. So glad so many councilors are with us here. So let's start with the capital bond. Um, those those are the, we'll do it in this order. And if we, the, um, the, the, we are, as um, I'm sure that people are wondering, and as hopefully it's not an enormous surprise, we, we are considering uh, in the wake of the um, capital bond not getting to the two thirds uh, support that it needed in the special election in December. We have been evaluating that carefully and we are considering um, bringing back on town meeting day a um, significantly uh, smaller um, bond. Why, why are we considering doing that, even though, you know, we fell, you know, 10% short of that two thirds threshold. So what makes us uh, be consider coming back? Um, uh, it, it, we did find it significant that uh, it wasn't enough, but that a strong majority of voters uh, uh, did ultimately support this, despite the kind of unique circumstances and headwinds that we faced um, uh, with making this decision right now. Uh, and moreover, we think we can um, uh, directly um, address some of the major concerns that we heard about the $40 million bond. The biggest one, and one that I certainly know, um, I had you know, some tough conversations with, with uh, school board members in which, um, you know, which we did try to be as responsive to those concerns as we could once, but we were already airborne. We, we now, um, have greater ability to be responsive to the concerns about uh, how we can be investing in Memorial Auditorium when, you know, first of all, it's now clear that, that uh, which is not entirely clear when we, we kind of set down this path that the downtown site is, is not going to be where um, uh, the future BHS will be. And, um, uh, and 
Um, we uh, have done additional work to, to kind of figure out how we would get through the next 18 months or so to get to the other side of the big decisions the school district has to make about the, about the high school, um, spending, uh, keeping the building standing, which I think is important. I think many Burlingtonians still care about that building. We need to keep the heat on there and that will, because of the situation at the building require uh, substantial expense, um, but just about we, we think we can find a way to, uh, you know, essentially wait on deciding the future of the building for 18 months or so uh, and take almost, you know, take 90% of the uh, Memorial Auditorium cost out of the bond. Um, we, as you'll see in a moment, are there are a few other discretionary items that were an initial that initial um, uh, total and they have been cut now. We also have greater clarity about not, not, we're far from complete clarity. It's going to, you know, uh, the federal infrastructure bill has, has passed and they are starting to get out some written direction on it. There's a lot that is still unknown. There's dozens of new programs that are being created. A lot of the programs um, yeah, we're, we're, we're some time from really knowing what the impact on the municipal budget will be, but we are fairly confident in at least a couple of area bridges, to some degree roads, um, we are hopeful we will be getting some budget relieving dollars uh, that um, allow us to reduce uh, some of what we thought the local need would be there. We will have to put a little bit more money into local matches and you'll see that's the one thing that is sort of going up in this final bond. Um, uh, another thing that's changed since uh, the vote and since we first started fielding concerns about the um, property, about the capital bond vote is that we have now created and gotten council approval for a property tax relief program that I think might be, of, I think I, I'll try to get too far in the weeds here, but I, it, there could be questions because this does go a little bit to some of our shared responsibilities. Um, one of the really unfortunate aspects of the reappraisal is that a lot of tax pr property taxpayers that saw big tax increases got caught in this sort of gap year issue where the state assistance for the, the uh, education side of the property tax um, is lags a year behind. And so for people who saw, I think, greater than a 50% or, or greater than a 40% increase in their valuation, um, they, there's a year before they will be getting the offsetting increased, um, essentially assistance from the state. And so we have designed a program that we were going to put about a million dollars. We budget about a million dollars of our emergency funds to, to help, um, the kind of hardest hit property owners and ones that, um, meet certain, uh, that, that are really great in greatest need here. And that's a, that's a change from when we were campaigning for this before as well. Also, I think we're going to be able to be a little clearer, and, and I think we need to be clear um, as we have the public conversation about what the pretty severe consequences of uh, would be of, um, uh, of of not being able to secure any bond support even at this lower level. So, with with that, that's sort of the bigger picture on the capital bond. Um, probably shouldn't spend a ton more time, but Chapin, I'll turn it over to you if you to get into a little bit of the detail on this. Uh, on this graph here. Hey, Mayor. Thanks. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. We'll make this exceedingly brief. These are some of the key asset class areas of what we're proposing to bring forward. Uh, as you'll see here, this is about a 70% uh, uh, it's about 30% less of what was originally floated in December. So you'll see here on the left category the uh, the different asset classes, uh, some of which are, uh, many of which are going down. You'll see here with civic buildings, we have a multi-departmental capital committee that has worked closely to sharpen pencils and look at deferring some items that can be deferred and trying to raise federal dollars where we can to, uh, to match. So uh, some of the key areas, uh, bridges have been reduced significantly. Um, where you're seeing there, streets and bridges are down uh, nearly $2 million because we are fairly confident we can get federal funding to uh, match that. And um, facilities was down somewhat and we have increased the local match line, which you're seeing here on this screen by a million dollars. Uh, that will uh, hopefully generate four to $5 million of 
additional federal funds as often our transportation projects are a 20% local map. So uh, emergency response is a key part of this with the fire trucks and the communication systems you're seeing here. And I'll leave it with that and we can talk through any uh, questions later. Great, yeah, there was a slide we, we jumped over quickly that gets into what, what sort of the, some of the impacts of, of not having the supplemental funding will, will be. And if there are questions about them, we'll, we'll come back to that. So um, we are also in position where we are moving to the next topic. Um, we are seeing uh, little choice, but to ask for some kind of um, uh, operating, uh, to operating revenue assistance as well. Jordan, if you wanna advance to the, um, this, is, this is, so to talk, I wanna talk a little bit about our property tax situation. And for school board members and city councilors that have been here for the last five years, hopefully some of this sounds familiar and is, is not new, but I know there are many new, new, new people here. And I think it's important to, to understand the situation the city is in and why, um, you know, somewhat, it isn't, it isn't something that happens every year uh, that the city comes forward for an increase in the property tax rate. Um, it's much more common that it happens on the school district side. It, it's, not, it's less common for a variety of reasons, mostly because the city has worked hard going back well before me and including this administration to develop other revenue sources that mean that um, we can deal with rising costs and expanding services without always having to resort to, uh, to property taxes. Um, the way basically you, I know, have much less flexibility there. The, the district has much less of that flexibility. Um, that fundamentally, the property tax does remain by far the biggest source, about half of the total, a little more than half the total. Uh, general funding for the city. Um, so it, it, it is certainly our most important funding source, um, but it is one that we have had success. We've gone, you know, a number of years at a time without having to ask for increases to the rate. And that, you know, that's hard to do when you have a system where, uh, as, as is the case with the school budgets, um, we, we do not see essentially very, almost no new rev, you know, Expenses rise with the rate of inflation every year. Most of our revenue, some of our revenues rise, um, but the property tax does not rise with inflation at all. It requires a vote uh, of the public for there to be new, the new revenues. And um, that can be offset if you have a period of, of development and investment. And it's certainly something we focused on and we are trying to encourage. Investment does result in new revenues. Um, but generally, historically, we have somewhere between a half a percent and one percent a year of new revenues from development. And so that, that really creates the annual challenge that we face. How do you keep up without cutting city services? How do you keep up with the, the rate of increase when the revenues don't increase with inflation? Um, you see, we've done pretty well on that over a large period of time. And, and certainly over the last decade, when I've been in charge of these budgets, we've kept the total city rate. Um, of property tax increases less than the rate of inflation, um, cons so, uh, considerably less than the rate of inflation. That in 2019, we came forward and asked for um, a small operating rate increase. And, and we signaled at the time that we were concerned that some of these larger trends that had allowed us uh, to keep up with inflation without property tax increases were likely kind of coming to an end. Our ability to keep creating new revenue sources is being regulated and constrained by state government. Um, and, um, and, you know, we, we're not anticipating a major change in, in the, the development revenue. So if we advance to the next slide, um, this, is, this is what I'm talking about that we've had. Inflation has been up about 24% over the last decade. Uh, total municipal tax increases are up about 20%. And now we're facing um, over the last year and to some degree the year before that, uh, some of the some you know much higher rates of inflation than we've uh, faced historically. And really the largest, I think as everyone is aware, you know, we're up at close to seven percent now for the last year, which is um, the highest we've seen since 1982. And we are anticipating that that is really going to hit our bottom line in the upcoming year as we are negotiating four new collective bargaining contracts. 
Um, here's another way to look at these historic trends um, and, or, and really what's happened over the last 10 years. Uh, and what you can see in this is um, that if you look at the bottom half of the graph, you well, everything other than debt service, if you will, largely balances out that you have, um, we have had, these are all the different city taxes and we have had many that have not kept up with the rate of inflation, uh, a number that have, that have been a little bit above it and that about cancels out. Debt service is really the difference. Debt service and retirement are the two differences. We, uh, we have made, um, you know, in console, you know, in kind of coordination with, with, the school district and with lots of deliberation and discussion, we have been making much greater um, capital investments over the last decade because, you know, frankly, we needed it. Our, our, we had had chronic underinvestment in many areas until this 10-year uh, capital plan that was uh, approved by the voters um, back in 2016. Um, that, that The debt service uh, part of our municipal bill, which is about 20%, has gone up by design um, significantly, and we think it needs to go up uh, and can continue to go up. If you, this is also an interesting graph, I think, to frame up this discussion. What you can see here is um, the, the, the kind of going back 15 years now, and I'm sorry we don't have it updated till, till it'll be the last two. Uh, it would be a, a little bit of a change. We will update it. I, I would like to see it represented here because you know, over the last couple of years, your um, as Tom just reported, the, the school district rate has been rate increases have been very modest. Um, the red line uh, shows that you know going back 15 years, though the the rate in which the school taxes have been going up has been substantially kind of steeper curve, if you will, than the city rate, which is the blue line at the bottom, which has been you know considerably flatter. And what the green line shows is that as a result, it, the what our kind of shared taxpayers pay every year, the percentage of their bill that is going to the, um, to the city has been going down pretty sharply over that 15 year period of time. And I think the same was true for about the 10 years or so before that as well. So it's gone from since 2006, uh, about 40%, it's a little, maybe a little confusing, to, to measure the green line, you got to look at the yellow numbers on the right side. It's gone down the city getting about 40% of the property tax uh, uh, revenues to about 31% as of a couple of years ago, and it's still approximately there now. So in some ways, that's great, right? We needed major investments in our schools as a community that supports schools. And I think it's been great school, that the city has been able to um, kind of work with the district and, uh, and avoid incre increases of the property tax rate to, so that we can all kind of make it through, uh, you know, make, get all the needs met. What, what I've been raising concerns about and really trying to be explicit about it now is we are really concerned that these trends um, are going to be hard to sustain going forward. And what we are doing now here in 23, we also did before the pandemic in 20 and in 19, it, there needs to be some more frequent um, uh, rate increases uh, for the city if we're uh, if we're going to be able to continue the level of, of municipal services that I think the public you know has come to expect and, and demand. So that's that's sort of the backdrop to this. The pandemic made everything a little bit crazy, and I won't spend too much time on that. I think the next slide kind of sums it up. Um, we did get this. Uh, tax increase in March of 20. Um, and uh, then we didn't use it um, in 20 because the pandemic hit. Um, we did, we deferred that tax for a full year, uh, even and, and deferred creating this third ambulance that the voters had supported for a full year. The housing trust fund tax that had increased, we deferred for two years. We don't think we can continue that kind of, of deferral. And let's get go to the next slide. Um, here's why we think for the first time since FY21, we, we do need to come forward again. And, you know, I, I know Catherine, not losing a ton of time here, but I'll turn it over to you if you want to say some uh, quick things about how you're looking at the, the 23 budget. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will be brief. Um, as the mayor mentioned, uh, we are facing substantial inflation 
And during a year when we are negotiating with all four of our labor unions, uh, we are assuming that will lead to increases in our workforce, co workforce costs. Um, as we mentioned, uh, that's compounding uh, because there are still costs from the FY18 contract um, that have been um, sort of buoyed by first the unassigned fund balance and then some of these federal funds um, that need to be built into the structure of the property tax. Um, we have also um, invested uh, heavily in new equity investments. Um, so we are going to be talking with the Board of Finance um, on Monday. And of course, uh, given the election calendar, we will need to act before the end of the month. Um, and then on the next slide, uh, we just briefly wanted to uh, reiterate, and I'll let you read these. Um, the, to remind you of all of the ways um, in last year's budget, we really were afforded the opportunity to increase our commitment to equity in these tangible ways. Um, but in, in some ways, we did use one-time money. Um, and so um, through a variety of ways, including um, likely a rise in the property tax, um, we will need to continue to fund these next year. Um, and I think that's it. I'll turn it over to you, Mayor. Yeah, great. I mean, I, I just, um, I, I want to say a couple more things about these, these equity investments. And I think, frankly, I think this is an area where in some ways the district was ahead of where the city was um, uh, leading up to uh, 2020. Um, we, uh, in the, in the wake of the um, murder of George Floyd, we had a massive community conversation about the need to accelerate the city's racial equity, racial justice work. We had, we had started down that path uh, of really getting more intentional about this work in 2019. We hired our first racial equity, inclusion and belonging director, um, but there's no doubt that what happened in 2020 uh, really uh, accelerated um, rightly uh, our focus on this, our, our investment in, the, in this area. We made investments to go beyond racial equity a, as well. Um, uh, it, uh, and you can see some of the other ways there. Um, I will say we are working hard. Um, we were certainly aware, as Tom mentioned, of course, you guys were aware that um, that and we signaled um, when the budget was passed last year that uh, we didn't have structural funding for certain areas. We we are continuing to work, and certainly if the Build Back Better plan passes, which would bake in some new structural funding from the federal government, um, there I think is a substantial opportunity. We are hopeful in the years ahead to pay for some of these equity investments with non-local sources and. This will be a small part of uh, any tax increase in the FY21 uh, budget, um, in the, sorry, in the FY23 budget, but it is something that um, uh, we are, that we do have to grapple with uh, uh, in, the, in this year and probably the years to come is how are we going to make good um, uh, on, on these commitments that, um, uh, that we, we talked that, you know, that we committed to in 20, uh, 2020. So, I think that's it for the FY23 budget discussion. And then finally, I'll be as brief as we can. I do wanna talk, this too requires a little bit of historic context. I wanna talk about our downtown TIF district. Tax increment financing, you know, it's a, I think probably everyone on this call has heard about it. I, I imagine there might be, unless you kind of get into the weeds on it, it can be a pretty confusing topic. I think the top line, the headline that I hope everyone is aware of and agrees with at some level is that TIF districts have had a major impact on Burlington's evolution over the last 30 years. A lot of what we enjoy about the waterfront today um, would not have happened without a TIF investment in, in the waterfront. And that investment has led to a massive increase in the grass ground list in 
uh, in the waterfront uh, TIF district um, over the, that life. And, and some of that, we're coming towards the end of the waterfront TIF district's life. And the city and the Ed Fund will, in just a few years, uh, be getting a pretty substantial boost in revenues when that TIF district expires because of, because of that, that success. We basically have an opportunity and have been working for a decade now to do the same kind of transformative improvements to the downtown. If we want, can go to the next slide. Um, sorry, I think you dropped, jumped over one real quick. Um, yeah, next one. <laughs> yeah, there we, no, there we go. So um, I guess this doesn't say that much on it other than the, the, we, well, sorry, it's one more back turn. I think is important to, well, sorry, maybe I'm screwed up here. The, basically the point is we, uh, go go ahead and advance. We, we they started down this path 10 years ago, Mayor Kiss got the Waterfront TIF District approved. Um, maybe it's the next slide. There was a vote in 20, uh, middle of the decade, 2015, that authorized the first funding into the, uh, into the downtown TIF, $10 million of funding. We'd use that to rebuild St. Paul Street. Um, and make important in, uh, investments in the, it was part of the city hall park transformation as well. We have a lot more capacity um, in, in, the, in the downtown TIF district. Um, there's about $35 million of total capacity. And um, what we have been focusing on is the major transformative investment and talking about for years would be a rebuilding of Main Street that would be in some ways even sort of more dramatic and impactful than the St. Paul Street rebuilding. And if we can advance to the next slide. Um, th this just says our time, our key, we're approaching a key deadline on this and that, and we would have been here sooner if it wasn't for the pandemic. The legislature has twice granted us and all the other TIF districts in the state uh, one year extensions because of the pandemic. But um, uh, in, March of 23 is our outside deadline for incurring debt in the downtown TIF district. If we don't incur debt by then, um, we lost our ability to do that. And, um, and a lot of money um, uh, flows back uh, to, to Montpelier. Some of it would end up in the Ed Fund and maybe diffusely get it, mine it, make its way back to Burlington, but the impact in Burlington would be much less than if we make this investment. If you go to the next slide. So the, what we've been eyeing is a transformation of Main Street. Eyeing is not quite the right word. We've been planning and working hard on a transformation of Main Street for, for many years now. Um, this is the block, believe it or not, uh, just south of, uh, sorry, west of St. Paul Street. The, that building on the left side is, is uh, where um, uh, the bike shop, um, uh, uh, I mean, a major brain cramp here, but it did um, help me out here, Chief. North Star Sports. North Star Sports. Glad they're not on the call. Um, that that's uh, uh, it's that block which currently has diagonal parking on both sides of the street. If you go from diagonal parking to parallel parking, you can get a sense. You suddenly get a totally different public space. You get protected bike lanes on both sides of the street. You get these green areas that protect the lake and have a stormwater filtration role, you get these very healthy tree um, tree belts that would allow us to reclaim some of the historic canopy that uh, Burlington had back you know, in the elm uh, tree period. We have one more graphic here that sort of shows how you can get such a change. Um, that, that middle row there is the existing street where you can see 73 feet of our 99 foot right away is currently dedicated to asphalt. Um, if you go, if you make the simple change of going from diagonal parking to parallel parking, you retain three quarters of the parking, um, and you can also get in all these other aspects, the bike lanes, the tree belt, and the, and the additional wide sidewalks and, and, and uh, areas, for opportunities for outdoor seating. So that's why we've been working towards this, um, and the deadline is approaching on us. So the bottom line is, uh, we are we really have two choices um, uh, to bring forward TIF authority uh, vote um, for this project, either this March or potentially next no, November. By next March, it will be too late and we will 
not, it would be extremely complicated and probably impossible to uh, incur the debt in time. Um, and um, uh, the good news on this that we certainly work to remind voters of is there is no impact on property tax rates uh, as a result of a, of a yes vote. Um, and um, that makes it certainly much easier to for you know for voters to accept than uh, you know than a capital bond vote, which does have an impact on property taxes. We're going to have to work hard. I, I think you know there may be substantive concerns. I'm sure we will hear concerns about construction disruption. We're going to work really hard, having learned to take all the lessons learned from the St. Paul Street effort and, and minimize the impacts on merchants and the public. Um, and uh, so why don't I leave it at that? I know I, I'm, since I've gone probably too long, but a uh, lot, lot of big stuff going on. Thanks, Claire. Thank you very much, Mayor. At this time, are there any follow-up um, counselors and some, some of the counselors had questions, I mean, weren't able to see all that document first and school board members for the mayor? All right, seeing none, it's it's clear that, oh, Commissioner Fisher? Uh, Councillor Carpenter has her the hand oh, raised. I didn't see that, sorry, thank you. Councillor Carpenter. Hi, I just want to repeat to the mayor and all of us, we very quickly need a really good public information campaign on how the TIF taxes work, this whole issue of the lag and the homestead credit, I mean, we've only got six weeks to do this. And so I just, we got to get cracking on that. And it's going to have to be redoubled for November because um, people are not going to understand this. Agreed, Sarah. Public information is going to be key. And it, and it is different these days, you know, the, the change in the, the COVID voting really changes elections and we're all, uh, we're, it, it's, uh, it, it front loads when, you know, the need to get that the information out faster, uh, given that a lot of people vote right at the beginning of the election cycle. Yeah, I would speak to that on behalf of the board. Um, we recognize that there will also be some board members that will not be re running again for election. Um, and so we'll have some new candidates as well as those candidates being educated um, and and this, those that are looking to run again, uh, as well as city councilors. I know um, it's election time for the eight uh, city, eight school board members um, and for city councilors uh, this um, town meeting day as well. So it behooves us both to have um, those talking points as well as a clear understanding of what's involved. So from the school board's perspective, um, based on the December ballot um, and you going forward, $25 million is what you, you will be presenting to city council for approval um, for yeah, I would say that what we just showed you um, is the first, uh, this is the first, we've been working since December 7th on a refinement and this is not a final um, document yet. Really, this is the first time we've been positioned to, to talk about it publicly, this meeting. Um, we will be on Monday going to the Board of Finance um, and having, uh, we, had, we had an initial discussion with the Board of Finance already that we were likely to come uh, come, you know, we, we had a meeting after the December 7th where we told them we were working on this and talked about some of these issues. This is the first time we'll have a conversation with, uh, with some numbers. So yes, uh, the Board of Finance and, and school, and sorry, and city councilors have not weighed in on this yet. Um, and we need to take action if we're going to put it on the March ballot um, at the January 24th meeting is, is when um, there would need to be a vote. Okay, and then the TIF uh, ballot item would be no uh, cost to taxpayers. That would be- uh, Yeah, I mean, some people maybe object to saying it quite like that, but the, it, I mean, this is taxpayer money in some sense, but the way it works, you can vote yes in there. This is money that has, the way the TIF districts work, these money has been sort of segregated in a way and a yes vote or a no vote has no, no, no impact on the tax bills you're going to get from the city, you know, next year or, or the years year after. I mean, this is this is ultimately all property tax dollars still, but it's 
largely property dox dollars coming from future development uh, from from in, in my, you know the concept of it is is development that didn't exist before the district was created and that the the district the existence of the district and the investments of the districts are expanding the pie are are uh, growing the property tax base that will be there. And there's a lot of good data to back up that that's the way it's worked in, in Vermont, not just in Burlington, but in other Vermont's other, other, uh, other, other TIF districts. Commissioner Alwell, thank you. Yeah. I've been very leery of TIF and TIF districts, and you know this, I've questioned it many times. And from across the country, Many other cities and states have stopped using TIF. And their biggest reason is that it takes away funding from schools. So if you, don't, if you want us all to support this, I have asked this many times and I have never gotten a straight answer from anyone in City Hall <laughs> how this works with schools. And I really would like to know that. I'm, I'm not being obnoxious or anything. I really want to know how yeah. this works and why is it that states across the country have stopped using it for that reason? Um, great, Kathy. I appreciate getting this out on the table. Certainly for this meeting, I think it, it, it's a good place for us to really discuss this and, and try, to, try, to, try to talk it through. Um, it is absolutely the case that almost that every state in the country has TIF districts just about, and many, many states and cities use this. I'm not aware of a movement or a trend to, away from them. There is some, certainly there are controversy in other states as there are, as there is some controversy um, in, in Vermont uh, about them. There are a lot of, you're not alone and not liking uh, TIF districts, but I don't, I don't, I don't know that it's, if you had, that's actually news to me. If you're aware of there being some major trend to get in the, the direction, that's not. When I talk to my mayoral colleagues, um, many of the cities that I've visited and seen that have done great things with their public spaces have largely done it with the benefit of TIF districts. They can have a huge impact, just like they have had uh, on the Burlington waterfront, and are have. You know, you wouldn't have had the investment in Winooski that has happened over the last 10 years, 15 years without that TIF district. St. Albans has had this incredible. Uh, resurgence in recent years, TIF played a huge role in that. So this does come down a little bit to, I think the controversy on TIF, a lot of it comes down to whether you believe that government public infrastructure investment can, has an impact on people's making investments in the city uh, or, or not. All those examples I just gave you seem to me quite compelling examples of how Investments in Lake Street, investments in the bike path, um, investments in Waterfront Park, investments in that whole street network in Winooski have led to enormous growth in the, in the grand list in, in, in those cities. And if that happens, schools are beneficiaries. Ultimately, it takes some time the way TIF works out. Um, uh, because the way it works is this, Kathy, I'll try to be as straightforward as I can. The, in 2015, I think is the year it began, uh, incremental new revenues that began flowing into the downtown TIF um, uh, started to be segregated. 75%, I believe, of the revenues, the new revenues of both the municipal taxes and the ed fund taxes, when there was new taxes, didn't do anything to erode the existing taxes, but in fact, any new taxes, 25%, and this was a legislative change, does continue to flow to the Ed Fund and the city. But 75% of the new tax revenues flows into this district. And it is there accumulating and building up. And that's why we say there's $30 million of capacity there, about 30% of which would have been going to the municipality without the TIF district investment. 70% um, would be going uh, to the Ed Fund, you know, go to the Montpelier Ed Fund. Um, and um, so that's why now it will be accurate uh, when we talk to voters, if we have this on the March ballot, um, a yes vote, a no vote has no, um, has, has no impact on, uh, on the, 
that what is happening in the district is completely segregated from ed fund and uh, city finances at this point. A yes vote, a no vote does not um, result in, in a change to that segregation. If, if you were to never use that money, the money would ultimately be re returned to the ed fund, but there also would not be as much money um, in, in, in all likelihood. It's a whole theory here without the prospect and the actual uh, investment of, uh, of public infrastructure investments. Thank you for explaining that. And I'm sure we'll, we'll like Superintendent Flanagan, you know, creating those narratives for us to be able to understand um, and explain will be incredibly valuable. The time is 725. Um, so I wanna be cognizant of um, keeping everybody on time of, of ending the meeting by 730, but I do see um, School Commissioner Haji uh, with your hand up. So next question. Thank you. Um... Mayor Weinberger, I'm wondering what community involvement um, looks like through the TIF district deadlines and how this information is accessible for community members. Great, and th thank you. Um, so the, we do have, and maybe Jordan could, could share, even as we're talking here, you can do the share screen. There is a web page that exists for um, this Great Streets effort already, um, and has been up for, for years, um, in that there was an earlier, uh, and Chapin, you can help me out here if you remember the timing on it exactly. I think there was a lot of public engagement and effort around this already, uh, back leading up to the St. Paul Street work. And so 2016, 2017, 2018, there was a, there was a lot, there was some community engagement already. Clearly over the next um, two months, if, if this is going for town meeting day, that needs to um, uh, be re, uh, re engaged and restarted. And the good news uh, uh, that is that one benefit of the pandemic is we now have a lot greater capacity for, uh, the city has added capacity for communicating um, with some uh, members of the community that we. Uh, I think historically have not done as good a job communicating about initiatives like this. So we're talking about our trusted community voices program that has where we have representatives from um, each of the numerous different refugee communities that now are our part time city staffers and that help us communicate uh, with uh, these these communities, and um, so that will be one way is that we'll be, we'll be sharing information out through our trusted community voices. There um, uh, certainly will be um, numerous uh, public meetings, combined effort between CEDO, um, uh, Public Works, uh, uh, that uh, and the uh, and uh, the Church Street, the, the business support group, Car Al Nasrawi. Um, uh, to engage downtown stakeholders. And in that effort, it's definitely on our mind and needs to be a priority to make sure we're communicating, you know, not, not just with the downtown stakeholders, but with uh, the whole uh, range of Burlington's community. And we'll, we've already signed up to go to, of course, all the MPAs and do all the standard things, but we, uh, um, we do have these new tools, which we will be using to um, engaging all elements of the community. Do you want to add anything to that, Chapin? Given the time, that sounds great. Happy to answer any questions after. Thank you. And we also have uh, Commissioner Vanderputen, Commissioner Kerry, and Commissioner Fisher with three follow-up questions. Commissioner Vanderputen. Um, thanks. Commissioner Fisher had his hand up before I did. Would you are you okay with this? Okay, thanks. Um, so thanks for the presentation. As I'm digesting this, I have one question and one comment. Um, my question is about how the tax revenue sources and sort of this pressure that you are anticipating are affected by the undeveloped property in the downtown district, um, the area next to Macy's or what we're calling downtown BHS. Um, so if you could speak to that, that would be great. And then I will add my brief comment after that. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks, Polly. So 
Um, yeah, this is, I, I really appreciate the question because this is uh, something else that is, is um, I think widely misunderstood. The, because the uh, city place parcels are in actually the waterfront TIF district, which is a weird technical detail, probably not worth uh, getting into, but because it's in the waterfront TIF district, um, the fact that there has been a modest um, reduction in the, that, that property when the mall was there was one of the largest property taxpayers in the city. Um, and there um, has been a, a reduction of about 150,000 a year total, uh, I believe is the number. It's been a little while since I've looked at this, um, but I think it's about $150,000 a year reduction in the property taxes that um, that property was paying um, when the building was taken down. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, however, because it's in the TIF district, that was incremental revenue. And so that was revenue flowing to the TIF district, not to the, not to the Ed Fund um, or uh, to the city. So there's really been um, effectively no impact on on our on the on the Ed Fund or the city's operating revenues because of a couple of years, several years now of those reduced revenues. Of course, you know the the long, the medium and long term prospects. One of the reasons we're doing this is a great example of, you know, what the hope is if and when we succeed with this. And there's active efforts going on, as as you know. Um, there, that will go from being one of the largest property tax paying parcels in the city to by far the largest property tax paying parcel. You would go, the estimates were from a total payment of about 800,000 to something like approaching $3 million um, in total property tax payments. And that is a development that, you know, absolutely the, the, the vision of the development there involves this new public infrastructure cutting through the parcel, making it a much more developable parcel making it possible to have housing and uh, retail and, you know, multiple levels of, of development and, and, you know, a real neighborhood there. Um, that's, you know, kind of a, an example of the, the promise of districts and how investments in new streets or public infrastructure can result in a big increase in the, in the property tax revenues. And, and there would be a, a period in which those new revenues through 2035 uh, Seventy-five percent of them would be flowing to the um, TIF district, but after that, um, there's a huge bump to the the Ed Fund and and uh, and the municipal taxes. And that was one of the motivating reasons for for um, for pursuing this. Okay, thanks. That's pretty significant, and I think also in terms of public perception. Um, pretty significant. My comment is um, that I'm glad we're meeting tonight and I'm wary of the timeline and worried about competition for resources. And I look at the things that you are talking about for uh, improvement of the city. And I look at the need for a high school and tech center. And I think that they're, they they can't be in competition. You can't have one without the other. And you certainly can't have a thriving city without a thriving invested community, meaning a really great school. So I hope we continue this conversation because, um, you know, anecdotally, I know families that are leaving. They are moving to other districts nearby or they're choosing if they can afford it to send their kids to private schools. And that's a great loss for our city and makes it much harder to do all these great things if we don't have them here. So I feel a sense of urgency and I really hope that we do not find ourselves in competition between city projects and, and this necessary urgent school project that we have um, coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vanderputen. Commissioner Fisher. Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, I wanna to return to uh, Commissioner Allwell's question or concern about TIFs, uh, TIF districts and from, and I, and I think it comes down to the deferral of, of the taxes and, and the diversion of those taxes um, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of the, of the, of the timeline. And so the question that I have, I'm with, I'm with Kathy, is understanding if 
I get that there's a, a value that comes like with the waterfront, but that's an indirect value over a long period of time. My concern, I think Kathy's concern is what we've heard is that it, it, the projects that, that happen through the TIF divert the, the taxes from the normal stream. And so therefore they would not reach the school district until a certain amount of period has, has gone by. So I don't need an answer tonight, but I think that's part of Kathy's questions. And my concern is how would that impact the amount of, of funds that, that, that come to the school district in the short term and then over, over time? Thank you. I think we'll have the mayor respond to us, if you don't mind, at a later with a more, uh, if that's okay, Commissioner Fisher, so that we'll move to Commissioner Carey's and adjust the time. Commissioner Carey, thank you for that. My, my question was very similar. I just wanted to know if uh, no portion of the TIF funding mechanism could be directed to the construction of the high school. And it sounds like it can't be, That's, but I'm not sure about how that works again. It's similar to what Kathy and Michael have asked. It sounds like no portion of the TIF funding mechanism. Can no, that's right. Explicit, ex explicitly in the way the TIF program works, uh, TIF revenues, TIF, TIF district investments cannot be in school education uh, fund projects. This is, and there's a long history on this, of course. This is really the main way in which, and really basically the one of the only ways in which the state provides um, any support to municipalities for infrastructure is through the TIF program. And um, that's why the rules are, are, are written that way. So you absolutely cannot, um, the, the question that Mike and, and uh, Kathy are raising, you know, are I think fair debates and questions to have at the beginning when you're making a decision to start a TIF district or not. And there are, and I think there are and should be robust debates about that. Um, uh, you know, I think it is, it is certainly the people like me who believe in TIF districts really try to make the case. I'll say it one more time quickly that like in the, the Burlington City Place is a great example. You're not going to get $3 million a year in tax payments from that, from that site unless you make it this mixed use neighborhood and do this dramatic transformation. Um, same thing, certainly what's going on in Winooski would have had nowhere near the spectacular tax growth that they've had without this. Um, but it's a fair debate and, and people can make the other argument. That debate with the request to the, with respect to the downtown TIF district, however, happened a decade ago and the decision was made to create this new TIF district. The de decision that will be before voters is, um, uh, is, is not a choice. Can we send some of the money to the, to the schools? It is a question of whether um, we, we make it uh, an investment in this or you know, or, or not, if, if we choose to make no investments with the downtown TIF project, eventually, many years from now, some money would flow back to the Ed Fund. But I do not see that as a good outcome for, for Burlington. All right. Thank you very much for explaining that. And we'll follow up as well. Um, as Can I say just one more thing, Claire? I know the time is late, but I do just want to leave no one with any doubt on this, how committed I am and supportive I am to a new high school getting built as soon as possible. I have one daughter in high school currently. I have another one I intend to send there. Um, I, uh, I'm a product of Vermont school system, completely believe, uh, supported wholeheartedly the, the, uh, uh, the, the $70 million bond for the whole high school years ago and anticipate um, uh, will we'll have every expectation to be fully supporting this one and, and working uh, with you to pass this one and have, and, and um, as I have supported um, uh, all but the very first uh, school budget uh, uh, in my uh, 10 years in this, in this role now. So I, uh, I, I know it's, it's needed. I know the impact on the community. And I think, you know, what we have done together in 2018, and maybe, maybe we should talk more about this. I know that hour is getting late now. We created a mechanism where I feel that I, I can be wholeheartedly supportive of a very substantial number for this new high school um, and have that consistent with the um, uh, fiscal responsibility that this administration has always stood for, have that be, have, we can make a very substantial investment with no concern that Moody's will um, uh, downgrade us and we will lose some of the gains. You know, we have 
the gains we have made together, restoring the city's credit rating have saved Burlington uh, taxpayers and education fund taxpayers, tens of millions of dollars uh, over our borrowing because we've gotten back to a double A rating because we have this debt policy that we created together. Uh, we know, and we've checked in with Moody's on this recently, we know that there is substantial additional capacity and will be very substantial additional capacity, even if the city does get a support for this $25 million bond, there will be the ability to go um, uh, way beyond. And I don't think it's prudent to talk exact numbers until, I, I don't think it, I think the school district should be the one talking exact numbers, but um, we have been in conversation with Tom and Nathan and Claire and looking at our debt policy and there's very substantial capacity uh, to um, a bond for a new high school because of the work we've done together and be confident that we will not negatively impact uh, our, our bond rating, which would uh, send us backwards financially in this effort. So I'm committed to this. I've done a lot of work to put us in position for this to be, uh, to be successful um, and for the city to be successful. And I, I wanna be a partner with you uh, through the key period ahead and also a partner, Claire has made it clear she wants my help with the private fundraising. I think I can be helpful with that when we, get that teed up and, 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 and at the right moment. And so I wanna be a full partner with you in the success of that project. Thank you very much. And on that note, I know we all feel really strongly about the next seven weeks and working with Council President Tracy, Superintendent Flanagan and the mayor and all of us together, um, communication, printed materials, um, including the high school on those printed materials, even though we were a November a bond to come, uh, will be, you know, absolutely important that it's it's acknowledged and recognized. And I know we were really passionate about that speaking to you in November uh, for the December uh, election uh, ballot item. So thank yeah. you so much. The last item was simply to um, reach out and uh, ask that it had come as a suggestion, Commissioner Fisher had, had recommended to board officers and I wanted to reach out and we'll do a follow up after this, just based on time with Council President Tracy. We thought it would be important um, or helpful uh, and positive to if a member of city council and a member of the school board would act as liaisons between the two uh, civic groups, um, uh, leadership groups in, this, in the city um, so that we could uh, connect. And again, whoever wants to volunteer in this role um, as well as keeping us informed of city council, uh, updates and, and news. We know we read your updates on Front Porch Forum and we also read your minutes as well, uh, but it would just be a, an opportunity to have a more intimate uh, heads up on things that are critical and that are happening uh, as shared timelines uh, as we move forward. So I'll pursue that. We can, it's something we could do on email uh, that I can work with Council President Tracy, um, but we hope that um, that is something that we believe would benefit all of us, especially at this time, based on our issues uh, and our positivity uh, uh, moving forward um, in, in get, gaining positive results, mainly open communication. So we, we do believe it would be helpful from our end and we hope uh, you do as well. And I saw you shake your head, uh, Council President Tracy. So thank you for that reception. Um, and with that, if there's any other follow-up questions or anything I've missed, I just wanted to check back in with you, Superintendent Flanagan. You're muted, sorry. Hey, let me get my volume on. No, just thank, I, I appreciate the opportunity. The only thing I was gonna say is that I haven't had, the, I've had the chance to meet with most of the city councilors, um, but any new city councilors or any city councilors who I've already met with last year when I was doing my sort of welcoming tour, I'm, I'm happy to meet anytime. So just please feel free to reach out. If you have questions, we'll get some updates to you. And I wanted to say this at the beginning and I didn't, and based on the sort of end of the conversation there, I just have, uh, really appreciated the, my partnership uh, with Moreau and sort of our work together. I've always felt, even though I know we have some, you know, some complex stuff to work through uh, together as we work together as a city leadership group, um, we, we've we been meeting regularly and, and working together closely. And I've really valued that partnership as well as that of many of you on city council and just appreciate, you know, the, the collective spirit here. I think we all care about and, and want uh, the, the best for our students and for our streets and for our community. And, uh, and so I, I look forward to continuing to, to collaborate. And I think this is a great opportunity and hopefully next time it's over some food. 
Thank you. Well said. And thank you on behalf of the school board as well. And I noticed some of our attendees as well were city leaders um, within your leadership team. And thank you so much for those city leaders that were present and, and are listening in. Um, and we greatly appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. And uh, with that, may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. Seconded by Councillor Allwell. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Any obsessions? All right, the meeting has been adjourned. Thank you very much, City Council. Very appreciative. Thank you, Mayor.